there is an ancient Sanskrit prayer that says, may there be goodness to those who know the earth to be sacred. There's a Hopi saying and it's, how come he eat? And that, that says, how are you with your relations? Are you good with your relations? Ancient wisdom offers us guidance in how we meet these future challenges with the truth of who we are, the most important things in life. Sometimes when we hear the stories or the teachings, it's like you get this, um, this feeling of, yes, I understand. If we look to the wisdom of our ancestors who lived in a way that was much more simple and in balance with the earth, that can be the way forward. Hello. Welcome to the Rubin Museum. I am Karenna Gore, and I'm very happy to be a fellow here at the Rubin for this season, helping to curate the series of programs in the Karma series. And our, our part is called Ancient Wisdom Meets the Future. We're drawing from a diverse set of wisdom and spiritual traditions to discern an ethical framework. My regular job is as director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. So earth ethics figures very prominently in this series. And certainly climate change and other aspects of the ecological crisis in our planet are part of what we've been able to explore and discuss in different ways. I want to be sure to invite you all. The Rubin's a wonderful place. There's so much on offer here. And I know um, many of you have been here before. Some folks might be new to the Rubin. In terms of, of climate change, there's actually a wonderful exhibit that uh, people are invited to interact with. And the visitors at the Rubin really curate themselves. It's called The Monument to the Anxious and Hopeful. It's right in the spiral staircase. And so you are invited. It's by Candy Chang and James Reeves. And you're invited to please post your own uh, thoughts or anxieties and hopes and enjoy that monument while you're here. Today's program is very exciting. We are joined by two people, two thinkers, who are going to discuss how wisdom traditions can help us better achieve integral and sustainable development on our planet. Jeffrey Sachs is a world-renowned professor of economics, a leader in sustainable development, a senior UN advisor, best-selling author, and syndicated columnist whose monthly columns appear in more than 100 countries. He's twice been named Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders among them. He is the co-recipient of the 2015 Blue Planet Prize, the leading global prize for environmental leadership. And the New York Times stated that he is probably the most important economist in the world. Time Magazine calls him the world's best known economist. The Economist Magazine ranked Sachs as among the world's three most influential living economists of the past decade. He is joined by B.T. Bhikkhu, who is an ordained as a Buddhist monk in Thailand, Executive Director of the Middle Way Meditation Institute, a New York-based global nonprofit organization that focuses on the promotion of inner peace education as a means of attaining world peace. He travels globally to teach thousands of meditators from 30 countries on six continents. Through his World Peace Through Inner Peace project, he has touched people from all walks of life. And he says his quest is to bridge Eastern wisdom and Western science to serve humanity. Please welcome our two guests to the stage. You want to start? Yes. We ran here, I ran here with my daughter, knowing that I would soon be calmed down uh, because we have a venerable uh, Iku, uh, with us and a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, every time we've met, uh, he has started with uh, some, some wisdom uh, in practical wisdom. So I want to turn it to you. Okay. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Um, I met Professor Sa uh, last June 
that this June, and uh, we discussed about uh, the wisdom and sustainable development. And last 22 September, we have an event at Columbia University. And then I hear him say for the first time, I'm, I'm super excited. He said his hero is Buddha and Aristotle. And both guru share the same thing, balance. Buddha said the middle way. Uh, Aristotle said the path of moderation. So recently I have a privilege to introduce uh, the middle way meditation to Professor Sat <laughs> at his home. And I told him that the middle way is not just a concept, it's a ways of life. And deeper, it starts in silence. Like when Siddhartha gained enlightenment, he didn't talk to anyone. He's quiet. And he back to the middle way inside. So he, he whispered to me that we should start from <coughs> So I will guide everyone a little bit to get back inside. Uh, anyone meditated before? Can you raise your hand? Awesome. <laughs> so you know uh, the bit. Uh, but the little thing that uh, uh, the technique, we got different meditation, have different focus. Uh, this meditation, which uh, we can discuss more later, uh, is said by my master. He said he dedicated his life to rediscover what happened that night when Prince Tata sat under the Bodhi tree. And he mentioned the middle way is inside. Yeah. Uh, I collaborate now with more research. We need modern science to prove this. But my old, old master, he passed away a long time ago, he said, the actual middle way is here. He called center of the body. It's around two finger width above the navel. When it becomes truth, it is not uh, religious or science, it's truth. So you can try to the experiment. So I will guide you with some uh, relaxation. A breathing technique, everyone tried before, right? Breathe in and breathe out. But when you are settled, keep your awareness at the middle way, yeah, at the spot inside you, and keep it quiet, yeah, let everything sink down. Yeah, I told my student, meditation is a shower for the mind. So it's a shower time, not take it serious. Like when you go shower, <laughs> right? No step, just relax, take it easy, and let the pure water of wisdom shower your mind. Okay, are you ready? Okay, just relax and then let your hands on your lap comfortably. We have this inner peace time together. Before we start our meaningful conversation today, let's take a moment to relax your body, relax your mind. Our mind has been running on and on with different things in life. It's very important to give them a reward, a rewarding time of peace, of kindness, of love, that all residing inside us. So relax your body, relax your mind, and close your eyes in a soft and gentle way, similar to the moment you go to bed, very relaxed, very easy.
in, you can take a deep breath in and out. In and out. Slowly and gently. Every time that you breathe in, breathe the feelings of peace, joy, and happiness. When you breathe out, Spread out all concerns, worries, tension. Spread it out all in and out, in and out, slowly and gently. Relax. In and out. In and out. A deep breathing. You can feel more relief. You can feel more relaxed. Let it flow. Maintain a good feeling. And you breathe as normal. Do not worry about your breath anymore. Let it flow naturally. Then allow relaxing energy flowing throughout your body. Like when you take a shower in the morning, let the water flowing down from the top to cleanse your body, feel fresh. You allow relaxing water Flowing down from the top, your head, your face, shoulder, body, your buttock, your legs, all the way down. And feel like you are melting away to the surroundings. Peaceful, easy, simple. Then allow your awareness. Settle down inside yourself, around the middle part of your stomach, the inner middle way. Send up the body. Let everything sink down to the bottom. Relax. Gentle. Like when you see the feather of the bird floating down from the sky to touch surface of the water. Gently touch the center and let go. Feel the ripple of peace, the ripples of love spreading out. If any thought, any ideas come, let them fly away like a bird in the sky. Enjoy this relaxing time. 
peaceful time at the middle way, at the balanced spot inside yourself, in silence for a moment. Gentle and relax change your good feeling change your nice feeling of peace harmony yourself with the world with the universe and allow this peace to be with you till you go to bed tonight and slowly and gently open your eyes to remain calm and gentle inside yourself. Okay, thank you. How was it? Relax? You feel a shower? <laughs> okay, but for the second. That's how we usually start our economic seminars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, Congress and uh, cabinet meetings begin that way also. So it's... Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for being here. Thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, Karina, thank you for uh, thinking of this and uh, organizing the session. I really like the idea of uh, ancient wisdom and modern purpose, uh, partly because we have really lost a lot of connection with a lot of wisdom. So it's a, a matter of regaining some connections. I know with uh, me, it was a, a new discovery of uh, a lot of um, ancient Greek philosophy, which doesn't seem so ancient to me anymore. Uh, but at the time, it seemed very remote. And now it seems daily good sense and daily wisdom. Uh, but it is a matter of rediscovery, because we seem to forget uh, a lot as we also learn a lot. So we're going to talk about 
some of the ancient wisdom. And maybe uh, one point that would be good to start with is your teacher and what it means to uh, be rede- his attempt to rediscover uh, some of the ancient wisdom. That, mm-hmm. uh, in a sense, it means that uh, what he's regaining it was not simply passed along in traditions, but there's really an attempt to recover uh, mm-hmm. from a uh, hidden past. And maybe you could explain a, a bit about that and your own training in, in that tradition. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Karena, for having me. And thank you, everyone. Uh, this is my uh, very first public appearance in New York. I, I travel around the world, in Africa, in Jordan. And I, I write in my diary most of the time I'm the one of the most fortunate monks in the world. <laughs> I work with Muslim, I work with Jewish, and I work with a lot of atheists. I don't believe in God, I want peace now, I'm stressed. You know, those CEOs who have a lot of money, but very poor life. Yeah. So, uh, to touch on the wisdom, I would like to lay down some big picture. My master said, we become one when we close our eyes. And then we will feel that same fear, that same uh, expectation, this and that. But when we open our eyes, sometimes we see different and that sometimes is lizard. And he shared me this and I think the wisdom one, it become real wisdom. It transcends tradition. He mentioned this to me and I, I use it all the time when I travel and I would shoot back to what Buddha said. He said, the truth that really transform human being is one. It's like what? It's like sun in the sky that shine to all. Shine to Buddhist, shine to Christian, shine to politician, even shine to the president, shine to everyone. You know, shine for all. It doesn't choose, but we call the sun differently, right? In America, you call sun. Even in China, they call Tai Yang. We have some Chinese friends, Tai Yang. In different countries, you call different. I'm from Thailand, we call Pratit. Three syllable, Pratit. Right? You imagine American, Chinese, Thai, outside, and then Americans say, This is sun. And then Chinese said, No, no, it's Tai Yang. And the Thai will come. It's not sun, it's not Thai, yang, it's Praatit. And then keep fighting how to call that sun. You get the idea, right? Yeah, so my master said it's a waste of time fighting about the name. Yeah, let's get back to the essence without talking. And then he encouraged me and he told the professor that maybe we have more and more meeting to have a meeting without speaking first. Like a, let's do not talk first. <laughs> and then really feel good inside and then can start talking. Yeah. So that wisdom that can really fix the world, it needs to go back to the original form. Yeah. It can be called differently, but it needs to be original form, not contaminated by any agenda. Okay, not by power, not by anything. Go back to that form. And to get back to that wisdom, um, Buddha, he talked about three levels. This is in a Buddhist text, you can check. There's three levels of wisdom. Yeah. And the first one, uh, I'm, I'm from Theravada, we use Pali. Yeah. In Mahayana and uh, Vajrayana, they use Sanskrit. Yeah. You, you have some basic idea about this, Pali and Sanskrit? Uh, okay, just um, uh, shortly, in the Buddha time, Buddha speak Pali for the people, but Sanskrit is the language used in the high level of education in that time. So his teaching were recorded in Pali and Sanskrit. 
Yeah, we call Pali the Southern School. We got to spread to Sri Lanka and then go to Southeast Asia, including Thailand. And we call Sanskrit the Northern School. We got to spread to Nepal, uh, China, Tibet. So they transit from Sanskrit. Uh, even the, this series, the term karma. Yeah, karma, it become English term already. It come from Sanskrit. Karma, Nirvana also, Sanskrit. But Pali, we said Kamma, K-A-M-M-A. The same thing. Nirvana, we call Nibbana. In the center point, right? I'm from uh, uh, Southern School, Theravada. You know, eat the sun. <laughs> Sanskrit way, <laughs> Pali, is one thing. Okay? But I, I'm, I'm more familiar talking from Pali. Uh, easy for me. Buddha said, wisdom has three levels. And if we really want to fix, you know, the 17 SDG thing, we need to go back to the deepest level. Uh, he said the first level called uh, Sutta Maya Panya. Panya, you know this term? Wisdom, Panya. Sutta Maya Panya. Wisdom from studying. Uh, to translate directly, it is wisdom from listening, from hearing, from absorbing that first level. That's what we have in education. We learn from listen from someone else, from reading. That's the first one. Then the deeper one, it's called wisdom from deep contemplation. You learn and then you become more quiet. That's how new theory come in the world. New scientists discovery come that way. But that's not deep enough. Yeah, I think the moment Isaac Newton find the law of gravity uh, is a bit the second and the third. The third one is called wisdom from uh, intuition or intuitive interaction. In that level, don't use brain interpretation anymore. Super quiet. And woof, the wisdom comes from the deep source. Very pure, that not limited by this. Okay? I think we need more rigorous science that what is deeper than the brain? <laughs> because they discuss uh, in, in Thailand, we call this, um, you call the Mai, right? This is the Mai. But in Thailand, sometimes we call this this spot consciousness. Yeah, I think you learn some deep meditation, you know that the center of the control is here, not here. And the current science, we don't have reference enough. We need more understanding, sometimes we call it the second brain. So, the shining sun is possible. Is there since we were born and is still there after we die. But how to access to that wisdom, that's the key. Because now we get stuck in level one a lot. Noisy and, you know, with many colors. Yeah, many times when I teach meditation, I use the glass. When we were young, the glass is clean. And you look through it. You find the truth, you find the beauty right away. But when we grow up, we collect many colors. Red when we get angry. Blue when we feel sad. Green when we feel not good about politician. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when we try to look at it, we cannot touch the solution. We cannot find the beauty in it. Because it's so... We need deep wisdom to transform the second level, uh, the first level, the second level, to the third one the deepest one, and we need it for all, from ordinary citizen to leaders of the nation. It is a bit challenging, but that's the way to go, that we need to get everyone back to that depth. The answer will come up from that. Okay, so I think that, I'm not sure I answer your question. Could, could you? <laughs> but it kind of, this is how we- A we good do. start. <laughs> could you say, uh, uh, more about how to find that wisdom. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we need both. Okay, in what I learned from my tradition, there are uh, theoretical wisdom. Yeah, it's much like a one or two level that we read. Yeah, we have books, we have many things, we, we contemplate on it. But it's so important to have uh, experiential wisdom. For example, we talk about loving kindness. Yeah, you can dictate what is loving kindness. But to really live loving kindness, that's another thing, right? Yeah, to, to say it easy, but to really do it is challenging. And I, I agree with Professor the last time that this is a lifelong thing that you need to set a direction. I want to live differently. Uh, interestingly, in New, in New York, I'm so glad we have this museum, we have this conversation because it's so, you know, speedy, isn't that, out there. So we need both a theoretical to get the idea, and then you set a time. I told all my students, not find the time, make the time for that experiential wisdom that in the silence, you hear something you never hear when you're not silent. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a two-man track that you need to study more and you need to practice more. Yes. And what does the middle way mean? By the text in the Buddhist scripture, it's mentioned that the middle way is the path that leads to uh, insight, wisdom, through happiness and enlightenment. That's the path. But I, if I will give you a bigger picture, everyone know about the four noble truth, right? It's very scientific cause and effect. <laughs> and he's teaching very scientific. Number one is a tukka, is suffering, okay? Uh, samutaya is the cause of suffering. Nirota, the end of suffering. And the last one, maka, the path to the end of suffering. So the middle way, is inside the Four Noble Truth. Yeah, but it is the answer. You know, many times when I, when I teach uh, worldwide, and they said, oh, Buddha very uh, pessimistic, suffering, we, we want happy life, we want... <laughs> and I told them that, you know, Buddha never been pessimistic. He's not optimistic or pessimistic, he's just realistic. The other time when, when I teach, you, you, you don't like the term suffering, right? When you hear it and you don't feel good, right? Okay, I, I try to make it easier for you. So, the four noble truth number one, unhappiness is real, right? It's unhappy sometimes, correct? <laughs> yeah, that's a cause of that unhappiness. Okay, number three, happiness is real. Okay, and the last one, that's the way to achieve that happiness. I asked him, you feel better? Yeah, I feel better. Happiness, same thing. <laughs> it's just a term. So the middle way is the key concept of Buddha teaching. This is the way out. This is the path to freedom. In um, Buddhism, I think Theravada have been least known in the West because Dalai Lama popularized uh, Tibetan and then I think Nakhan or Tomahayana. But Theravada, we don't have a world leaders on Theravada much known. In our tradition, they have a different thing. I, I have been asked a lot, why orange? <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Anyone know the answer? Why orange? Anyone know? Have a clue? Nope. No? <laughs> In 2007, I had a very funny experience that, that the Theravada tradition really unknown in the West. Um, I was in England on my mission and I went to the supermarket with my supporter looking for something. Then a young boy come with his mom. 
Mom, mom, orange man. <laughs> That's my name for the young boy. And uh, he, he wants to run and come and play with me like a, the friend of Mickey Mouse. So, uh, <laughs> but this is orange man. He really don't know that I'm a monk or he said, wow, it's so orange. <laughs> then in the same period, and that time I cannot speak English like this yet. You know, I'm from Thailand, I need to study. So I go to the language school, and um, that's one lady, old lady, come from the back, and did she touch my robe? Oh, very beautiful. This is the latest fashion from Milan, right? Latest <laughs> 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 fashion from Italy. <laughs> you see how? This is in 2007, 10 years ago in England. And I cannot explain very much. You know, my English is not that strong. So I told her that, uh, Mom, sorry, um, it's not a fashion, it's my uniform. I tried to explain to her, yeah, huh? uniform. And um, it's not very modern, it's not new. This is around 2,500 years old. <laughs> and she kind of shocked and then she, she walked away from me. Like, <laughs> because she thought this is so modern fashion, like earth tone or anything. You want to know the answer? Your wife is orange. <laughs> and there are many theory about this thing. And in the Buddha time, the Buddha, he didn't uh, have like a specific the color. He said, use a color from the nature. But this color become uh, popular because when uh, Buddha travel with enlightened one, is by walking from one city to another one. It walked through the forest. This color is look like a flame. It chases white animals away. So it's safe. Safety reason. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been used, but you, if you read in a Buddhist text, they really write down this color. This is all. Yeah, it's very useful in the modern day. When I travel, I, the one who comes to pick me up, they never miss me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I come and then, oh, yes, the monk is there. <laughs> very useful. And this is, um, for some reason, it's a good poster. You know, people come to me a lot. So I teach meditation, wisdom everywhere, in the airport, a lot. People come and then, oh, you're Buddhist, ma? Yes. Oh, can you give me some wisdom? I just divorced. And I'm so painful now. And then, you know, so I'm, I'm so fortunate. So uh, that's the middle way in a concept, but as I introduce to you this meditation and I share with you, the actual middle way is when you get into your silent moment and get real touch with the middle way. The middle way is about balance. And I think I, I want you to uh, discuss more about the middle way concept in the bigger scale about SDG, about how the middle way and society will link. Because Theravada, especially Buddhism, sometimes, oh, you just focus on yourself. You just focus on your, it's not. Yeah, it, it's a very limited way to look at Buddhism. Yeah, that the middle way concept, it can start from one, personal, and then interpersonal. It can be related to other people, and then societal can spread. Especially in the modern day, we need that social media. We need that application. We need those things that will make children excited about it. Yeah, I, will, I will discuss more, but I would like to hear from Professor also that how this the middle way thing and the bigger perspective that how this will make society move in a better direction. We've been uh, discussing that together uh, because there are some uh, common thoughts of ancient wisdom uh, and uh, a, our Western tradition, which became very much part of our Christian tradition, 
uh, began uh, with, uh, with the Greeks. And one of the notable facts of history not quite understood is what uh, a German uh, philosopher, historian, Karl Jaspers, called the axial way, or the axial age, I should say, which is the period from roughly the 8th century BCE to about the 3rd century BCE, when in Western civilization, in uh, India and uh, South Asia, where Buddhism emerged, and in East Asia with Confucius, uh, there was a almost simultaneously simultaneous uh, development of new concepts of how to live, and that's uh, what we're talking about. Because uh, with Buddha or with Plato and Aristotle or with Confucius, the questions were about the good life and the way to end suffering or to achieve happiness or to uh, achieve nirvana or to achieve uh, in Confucian thought a harmonious society. And one of the joys for me is some of the striking similarities that these great thinkers uh, were able to uh, discern by very powerful reflection uh, and by uh, a lot of uh, wisdom and by a lot of uh, interchange with other thinkers. And in the Greek era, uh, I've told uh, the venerable monk that uh, my guy is Aristotle, uh, a uh, remarkable thinker. Uh, and we went a few weeks ago to his birthplace uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, a, now it, it's an excavation archaeological site uh, called Stagira, uh, which is uh, where he was born. And it was nice to walk on the hills where Aristotle uh, played as a child and uh, overlooked the sea uh, in, uh, in the Aegean. Um, he came to Athens uh, about about uh, 150 years after the Buddha's great uh, enlightenment. Uh, and Aristotle was, of course, the student of Plato, uh, the two of them being the most important thinkers of Western philosophy uh, during all of this period of uh, the last 2,300 years. And one of the things that is very notable about uh, Buddha's teachings and thinking and Aristotle's teaching and thinking is that they both uh, talked about, uh, Aristotle called it the soul, uh, but he meant what we would call the mind and uh, reason, emotion, uh, and the way we have to cultivate our uh, characters and our activities in a proper balance. Uh, and so there's it goes back very much inside. And it's interesting uh, uh, that Aristotle did not know where the mind was. Uh, and uh, maybe we don't know, but we think it's uh, in, in the brain. Uh, uh, but Aristotle thought it was probably the heart was the seat of the mind, uh, not in the metaphorical sense, but in a physical sense. Um, but he was able to discern incredible wisdom about uh, how the mind works because he wrote uh, a lot of about psychology uh, and he wrote a lot about character and the famous writing about character which I think is one of the greatest uh, books of the Western tradition uh, ever uh, is called The Ethics or Nicomachean Ethics. His son was Nicomachus. And it is probably a transcription by his students uh, of his teachings, but it's in, by tradition a book to his son about how to live. And uh, like the Buddha, he was asking the question uh, in the Western tradition, the, the question is, what is the path to happiness? 
uh, and the term for happiness in ancient Greek is uh, eudaimonia. And uh, the question is, how do you achieve the ultimate good, the summum bonum, the ultimate good? And when you read the Nicomachean Ethics this evening, uh, you'll see that he says, well, it can't be uh, for wealth. That's not the ultimate good. Maybe wealth can uh, help on something. It, it can't be for material things. It can't be for pleasure. The ultimate good must be for your happiness. And how do you achieve that? And w one could say that his answer is the middle way also. Uh, with a tremendous number of um, common uh, observations. But in the Western idea, but I think probably not so different from uh, the Buddhist, Buddha's ideas and Buddhist traditions, Aristotle noted that we are vulnerable to all sorts of excesses personally in our psychology, our soul, as he called it, the anime, is, uh, has what he called appetite of spirit or appetite of uh, force for food, for water, for sex, for uh, material uh, things, for pleasure. Uh, and we have uh, a, uh, what he called uh, the uh, rational uh, side, which is the contemplation, the thinking, and so on. And viewed in the Western in Aristotle's thinking that, um, th that the rational side needed to tame the, uh, the emotional side uh, and needed to keep it under control. Uh, not uh, to deny pleasure, not to be an ascetic, but not to uh, fall victim to uh, a dissolute life or to... Uh, uh, letting uh, an addiction to pleasures take over uh, one's life. And so the whole Nicomachean uh, ethics logic is to cultivate what he calls virtue, or it's translated that way it's in ancient Greek, it's arete. And the idea is to cultivate virtues. Uh, and the path to happiness is through virtue. So the path to happiness is... Uh, by cultivating virtues that avoid extremes. And Aristotle points out all the different extremes. Uh, and for every virtue, there's an extreme of insufficiency and there's an extreme of excess. And you try to find the virtue by moving between the insufficiency and the excess. So fortitude is a virtue. And fortitude means to be brave, to be persevering, but you shouldn't be timid. That's the excess of insufficiency, or that's the, uh, uh, that, that's the uh, um, uh, yes, uh, the, the insufficient side. And the other side is to be reckless. Uh, there's no virtue in running blindly to one's death, he said, you know, or to be uh, vaingloriously bold. Virtue is, yes, to be brave, but to be uh, in, in the middle way. And he talked about, of course, pleasure. He was not an ascetic. And the Buddha tried asceticism. He tried pleasure. Siddhartha tried the pleasure route. Yes. He found it boring after a while, mm -hmm. unsatisfying. He tried the ascetic route for many years, full denial. And he said, neither of these is right. And Aristotle comes to the same conclusion that he's, it's not about denial, but it's also not about dissolution. Uh, and it's not about uh, gluttony, lust, and it's keeping uh, yeah. measured uh, pleasure. And so it's very interesting because Aristotle was not a denier of pleasure, but he said, keep it under control. Uh, and uh, so that is... Uh, the virtue of, uh, of temperance. Uh, and uh, another Aristotelian virtue is the virtue of justice, to give what is due, not more nor less, not cruelty, not to excess, but what is 
rightly do, which is uh, the virtue of justice. And the overall virtue of good behavior in Aristotle is uh, uh, called uh, prudence uh, or phronesis. Uh, and uh, that is good judgment that you get in, uh, through experience and through good training, uh, good mentorship, uh, to be able to judge how to behave in any time. There's so many links with the uh, Buddhism. Uh, and also, Aristotle taught about three layers of wisdom. Uh, not exactly the same, but three types of knowledge. One is uh, what he called epistemic knowledge, which is scientific knowledge. It's like the book knowledge, yeah. but it's to know the science. A second kind of knowledge he called uh, techni, which is an artisan's knowledge that you have a skill, and that comes by diligent learning and so forth. And if you're a doctor or an electrician or an artisan, you have techni, you have technical knowledge. And the third kind of knowledge uh, he called uh, phronesis, which we call practical wisdom, uh, which is that you know how to behave. Uh, and he said, no young person can have phronesis. Uh, you can't pick it up in a book. Uh, it is by a lifetime of learning, um, a lot of uh, experience, because ultimately it's judgment. And judgment is uh, the hard school of, of learning. So I find a tremendous number of similarities. Uh, and Karina is looking at the lessons of the ancient wisdom for the modern world. And one thing I think we can say very clearly is there's a lot of excess in our society. And so this is, I think, relevant for, and a lot of suffering from that. People are not happy with the excesses. Uh, the amount of addictive behavior in our society is astounding. Uh, whether it's addictions to drugs, which is an epidemic uh, in America, whether it's an addiction to gambling, whether it's an addiction to consumerism, whether it's an addiction to power, like our president has, uh, whether it's uh, other kinds of, uh, whether it's an addiction to kinds of foods that are very unhealthy. Um, we're a society where Everybody's trying to stop addictions right now, and it's really a lot of excesses. Uh, and this is, and I'll just, uh, I don't want to uh, go on because I want to ask you for advice on all of this, but um, one of the things as an economist that drew me back to uh, th these issues uh, already uh, 10 years ago the realization that we are on a, a rising path of these excesses uh, in many, many ways. So it's not just that we have uh, these challenges and problems, but um, we don't have a language for them. And now I remember exactly what I was going to say. Uh, in economics, my field, it's really messed up uh, because when we study economics and when we teach economics, we have no reflection about our own psyches as we behave. So literally what you're told in studying economics is that you have preferences and you should maximize them. And so first of all, it doesn't say you should moderize them. <laughs> it literally, you're told from the first problem set you should maximize your utility. It's a strange idea, actually, in an Aristotelian or a Buddhist sense to maximize your utility, especially when you're told that your utility is a function of the things you buy. So you're supposed to maximize your utility. And we're told something, it's something about pay, pleasure, something about uh, the uh, flow of goods that you get from your goods and services, um, and you should maximize that. And there's no warning sign when you study the utility function, 
caution. <laughs> you might maximize the wrong thing. <laughs> you might become addicted. Do not try this at home. <laughs> and uh, be careful. Before you commit, you have a lifetime ahead. There's nothing like this anywhere. You're not, it's not even mentioned. There's a budget constraint. There's a utility function. Bingo, maximize. And then we think we understand so much about behavior. And in our society, when you start to think about how many people are struggling to undo what they do or are not happy with what they do, uh, you realize that this cannot be the right uh, point of view. And one last point, and then I'm back to you, please. Modern neuroscience is astoundingly interesting. And of course, as you know, a lot of uh, Buddhist thinkers are uh, dealing with a lot of neuroscientists. And I want to put the Aristotelian and the neuroscientists together because the neuroscience is telling us of many of these challenges in a different language, in the language of the mesolimbic system and the language of the prefrontal cortex and the extended amygdala system and how our brains can become very deeply distorted. And one of the major lessons of modern neuroscience is that there's a difference between craving and liking. Craving means you desperately want something. Liking, in some sense, means that it uh, gives you some pleasure. But our brains are not set up that those are the same thing, actually. And so people with addictions are craving something, but they don't even like what they're addicted to. Uh, sometimes it gives no pleasure at all. Maybe a momentary relaxation of anguish, but no pleasure. But you crave it. And in economics, there even conceptually can't be a difference of craving and liking because you maximize your, your utility. That's the same thing. That's your craving and your liking. So maybe you could say something about modern society and craving, liking, uh, attachment, and uh, your reflections on this. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, I think maybe this this not uh, directly address that question, but I think it's related because um, I'm not sure how many knows about this. That uh, I think just when the happiness thing started 2011. Yeah. Just recently, yeah, you heard about uh, the happiest countries in the world things. Or this year, which country is the happiest one? Uh, it just recently, but the original concept start 50 years back when King of Bhutan talked about gross national happiness, that we should not use GDP only to measure the progress of the nation. Right? You can imagine the United States has the biggest GDP on Earth. But are you satisfied? With everything? No, right? Some part is good, some part, the gap, you know, when, when the total number is big, it doesn't mean that it has an equal thing for everyone. It doesn't need to be equal, but at least have enough for everyone and there a lot of access. I think I read now many articles talk about uh, we have people die of hunger in a time that is plenty. But there's a people die up, they don't have anything to eat. How dramatic this world, and what are we going to do about it? So the concept starts, and then it starts to be, because what I'm interested in is how we make things personal into global scale. And especially Professor Sack, maybe we can talk more after this about the, the policy. He's always advise, government advice into policy, when policy, it touch everyone. And that's what we want to see, right? Not just one by one, one is too slow. Especially now, it's counting down, climate change, everything like that. It, it needs to be fast, it needs to be powerful. 
But there's a movement now to use happiness and well-being to be the main measurement. And this report that uh, next March gonna have the report that which country is a happier one. And they have a exact indicator. Equality is one, uh, empowerment of the world, you know, all those things that you want is in the list. <laughs> and now there has a shift. Because when it's announced, many rich country doesn't get a good spot. Right? And at the top level, that mm, is it not look nice. And the people, as it, it, especially the people, one is in public, then people with the real voice. <coughs> is it, no, no, <coughs> we, we don't want it this way. <coughs> Before coming here, I asked my master that uh, many people know that what needs to be done, but there are some big guys upstairs who controlling something, how we going I asked my master that, how are we gonna do about it? And then, you know, he point out to what? He point out to social media, <laughs> <laughs> which is surprised to me. He said, we need to use the same tool that make materialism spread so quick. Now it's like a, you just click it, uh, that craving thing even faster, right? He said, we need to use the same thing, but from good. He just point out that uh, if we can um, use technology and anything that's available right now, but tune it to the virtue, tune it to nice thing, then it can accelerate this thing. Um, many things is just neutral. It how we use it, but I think the concept that it start because when it's have money concentrated, everything go toward more money, economic, right? Maximize, maximize. But if the goal is happiness, the goal is peace for all, and it need to be louder than this, right? I, I hope that finally it's not GDP, that people are excited about it, but GNS, Growth National Happiness. <laughs> that are now people are happy about it and we use social media and we need more influencer. Until the people at the top let, no, we need to go this way, not just the money thing. <laughs> so if uh, we can kind of gear toward the virtue thing, but make it interesting, make it exciting, compelling, and more people engage, maybe we can walk on the middle path more. I can uh, just tell you one uh, episode uh, about this uh, journey. Are we going to 2.30? Yes. Yes. I just you want me to go to? Signal that, um, if we want to allow for a couple of questions, yes. then we need to make that transition in a moment. So Good. just yeah, please. carry on. Yeah, I just wanted to tell an anecdote about uh, this. The, the fourth king of Bhutan made a remarkable statement in 1971 about gross national happiness. And uh, by the way, Robert Kennedy, uh, you should look up online the speech that he gave about GDP in 1968, famous speech, uh, where he said GDP measures everything except that which is important to us. And it was a very beautiful speech in, in his presidential campaign, absolutely gorgeous. Well, the fourth king of Bhutan made this speech and Bhutan began to actually explore operationalizing uh, this concept by measurement and by uh, real work of uh, analysis of what would make our people happy. And uh, in that context, a wonderful prime minister of Bhutan, uh, the prime minister before the current one, uh, Thigmi Tinley uh, gave a uh, speech that I heard in New Delhi uh, in uh, 2010, I think mm -hmm. it was, and I was mesmerized uh, by it because he was talking about these issues. And we decided that we would uh, have a um, conference in uh, Timpu uh, 
the next year about happiness and bring in worldwide, uh, worldwide scholars. And in the context of that, the prime minister came back to the UN that fall and gave a speech, gave the speech, I would say, to the General Assembly, which is every September when the heads of state come and the traffic is jammed up here. And it's a very odd event in some ways because everything is translation anyway. People speak and there's usually a little applause and then they go, but no applause during speeches. But when the prime minister uh, of Bhutan gave his speech, he said in the middle of his speech that he, wa he recommended, we had Millennium Development Goals then, eight global goals. He said, I would like to propose that happiness should be the ninth Millennium Development Goal. And there was spontaneous applause in the General Assembly of the world leaders. And you just felt, wow, this is a world starved of happiness uh, because it resonated incredibly. And on the basis of that, uh, we worked together to make a resolution which the government of uh, Bhutan put forward to have a World Happiness Day and to study the issues of happiness in the world. Yes. And now every March 20 is World Happiness Day. And we use that as an occasion to present research each year on happiness which psychologists and Buddhist monks and scholars have a lot to say about. And so you can read online World Happiness Day, uh, or I'm sorry, you can read the World Happiness Report. You can find it online. It's very interesting. And it does discuss which countries are self-reported happiest. They are the Scandinavian countries, incidentally, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, the Nordic countries, Finland, uh, they score the highest and they live a kind of social life of moderation, uh, which is what they call social democracy. And I think that it really has some enormously beneficial effects. The United States has been going down and down in the rankings over the last 10 years, I'm one of the editors of this report, so I watch each year, I'm waiting for the new data just to arrive from Gallup International, which does the surveying each year. But the US is definitely going down, and it is not, uh, it's not different from the phenomenon that we're seeing of rising suicide rates, rising uh, opioid epidemics, rising uh, obesity, which is creating a lot of unhappiness in the society, uh, rising depressive disorders in American society. So there's something not working well. And when you, me but what do we see in our headlines every day? What will the growth rate be next quarter? Do you know last week it was revealed that for the third year in a row, life expectancy dropped in the United States. We're the only high-income country with falling life expectancy. Three years in a row now, it's gone down a tenth of a year each year since 2014. In other countries, it continues an upward rate. We have a sickness in society, and this is evident in many different counts, but one of the ways you can see it is when people report whether they're happy or not happy. We're, we're learning something about this. So this is first order important, but instead of reading about that or the suffering or the uh, solutions, uh, we're asking the same questions we've been asking for the last 70 years, which is will GDP growth be 3.2% next quarter? 2.7%, 3.4%. And the answer is, it doesn't matter for our well-being, actually. It's not the right measure. It gives some indications of certain things, but it is absolutely not a measure of well-being. And that is, I think, one of the most pertinent points. So we have a, a few minutes. And uh, who would like to uh, make a comment or 
make an observation. I'm, I'm here to moderate the Q&A, and I, we won't keep you too long, but um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you all so much, and uh, we'll do that at the end, but um, we'll just have time for a couple of questions. So we've got microphones here and there, maybe start back there, and then right here. If you were going to write an equation, as most economists do, for happiness, what would the three or four major variables be, and what would four or five of the minor vari variables be? My textbook's coming out soon. <laughs> uh, but it would be first, happiness is cultivated. It's not something that just is and it's cultivated by each person, and it's cultivated by society. So we shouldn't aim for thinking we're rich, we're happy, or let's get rich, but rather how to cultivate uh, happiness. Since I'm an Aristotelian, I would say you cultivate happiness by cultivating virtue. And cultivating virtue means helping people to live a good life that is uh, a life that uh, takes this wisdom uh, and uh, helps people to find a, a good path. Uh, and I don't think we have that adequately in our vision or our society right now. Aristotle made a big point, and I think uh, um, uh, the venerable monk made the same point just now, that friendship is part of virtue as well. Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics talks about social relations and good friends as being actually a virtue, meaning you work on good friendship. It's not just a transactional matter. Uh, and this is something where we have our social bonds in this country are really in a bad, bad way. So one doesn't achieve happiness only through an individual route, but also through a societal level. And I think the proverbial truth, which I very much believe that uh, happiness comes uh, more through giving than receiving, is also extremely important. If we had a society of where generosity was cultivated uh, and uh, recognized for what it can do, it would, I think, raise our well-being as givers and receivers, but definitely reduce a huge amount of the anxiety level. Our country, well, we're represented by a, we're not represented, we, we have a president who in the Greek term is, uh, has akrasia. Uh, akrasia means incontinence, uh, not, not in the uh, physical uh, sense uh, of uh, incontinence uh, in the psychological sense, no self-control, completely impulsive, uh, absolutely uh, unhealthy in his mind, uh, deeply uh, psychopathic in my opinion. And um, this is uh, leading to uh, great risks and uh, great unhappiness in society as well. It's no accident we have an epidemic of shootings and hate all over the country also because we have a hater at the top that uh, commands a lot of the attention also. And so we need also to understand that um, this is part of cultivating happiness uh, and we should not have Good character makes a big difference, and good character in a president may be life and death. Hi, thank you so much um, for both of your perspectives. I'm always very interested in practical steps. Um, first, as an individual, I'm curious, what are the, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of the steps between one's individual actions, and Venerable, if you could explain what those recommended individual actions are, could connect to broader systemic social change, which is what I'm seeing with the macro level view. Um, but I'm curious, 
those very specific steps and how you think that could spread outward um, towards the various levels of influence outward. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was in the Philippines, I'm a Buddhist monk, but I work in Catholic country with a bishop. And that's one the big event that really uh, reflective on this individual to the society, to uh, we have like a, we call light of peace event, like like this we have, like a, we meditate and we light up the light. It decides around uh, for football stadium, 100,000 is so large. And that three minister of the Philippines come yeah, with a big shop, with the imam, you know, the big event. And the whole field, uh, it become Guinness World Record because we make some, some image, the map of the whole Philippines and world peace through inner peace. Yeah. It's done in 15 minutes. It's super fast. You know what they do? They light up their own candle. They pass on to the next one. That's it. But everyone do it. Move. The whole field is light up and it becomes the largest image in the world. Instantly, just light up your candle, pass to the next one. But everyone do it, including the minister on the stage. You get the idea? Okay, that I think that very, uh, I mean, reflective, right? That the big thing is small. And we have social media, we have things that we can connect instantly around. We have this technology that can do this, yeah. But the thing is, we in a society and we're gonna light a candle or we, don't, we will not light a candle. What kind of candle you're gonna light up? You know, we're discussing we not light a candle. <laughs> Especially, you light your candle first, not mine. You get the idea, right? So this is the noisy world we are having that. That's why we need more some quiet time and let each individual connect with their good step and have something quite practical. Actually, uh, I think next September, I talked with Dr. Arikando yesterday, we will start the research on this we call inner peace education. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud to announce that now one school in Los Angeles start a subject called inner peace subject. <laughs> In school, grade 5 until grade 12, one private school so they can design. There's a, we want this for our children to be more calm. So we teach that four things which will be define happiness. Body, heart, mind, and spirit. We can use some other term, but that so part that Aristotle touched it. So this is the base of happiness. This is who we are. Body is a hardware. But that's a software part that we don't know so well. The, uh, the body, the heart, the mind, spirit. So this covers most of the things that we make us happy or not happy. We make it like this. Uh, we have a step that root from what Buddha teaches about healthy body. Yeah, Ayurvedic, you know, those things. Healthy body, you have great health, happiness is small. The second one, Caring heart, how we cultivate caring heart. Some, some born with it, some are not, but it can be trained through experience, through example. So we have caring heart, uh, great relationship, EQ. Now we link Eastern wisdom, Western science, PQ, physical caution, EQ, emotional intelligence, caring heart and then the intelligent mind, IQ. In this program, it focuses on genius also. That when you learn this subject, you become more intelligent. Neuroscience can prove it. When you meditate, things happen. And then the last one, the most challenging one, SQ, spiritual intelligence. It's still very new, but now we are digging to understand more because it's the base of everything. 
with PQ, EQ, IQ, and SQ, it becomes HQ, happiness quotient, your ability to be a happy person. Okay, now we develop this subject, and I'm so proud they learn mathematics in the morning, they learn inner peace in the afternoon. <laughs> and it's so interesting, we just experiment because of, I cannot be there all the time, I train three Americans to be instructor inner peace instructor. So they teach this at school. They told me the first week in Los Angeles, the children come to the room. Okay, today, uh, not much discussion, relax and say nothing. You know, they freak out. <laughs> because they were stimulated to think all the time. And when they were asked not to think, like a relax, don't worry too much. You know, some cannot stay. They need to, oh, sorry, I cannot do this. Mm -hmm. They go out. After about one month, I returned to the school, I checked. And then one young lady, maybe grade seven, she said in front of one, oh, Venerable, thank you so much for coming here. In the whole week, this is my favorite subject. <laughs> oh, really? Why? Mm. You know, other subject I feel like is outside and I'm, I'm tired. But in this subject, I feel like I am with myself. I feel happy. And I feel I'm in control. I feel good about it. I want to learn more. It's already start one school <laughs> with inner peace subject. So we want with Columbia, if we can have more research, it can be everywhere that we teach how to be a happy person not physics, not that can come later. Once you become a happy person, everything will work. Yeah, I have one formula to, to end this one. Happy people tend to make other people happy. Unhappy people tend to make other people unhappy. We want more happy people in the world. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we have time for one more. Um, Hi, thank you so much. This is so inspiring. Um, given that the uh, title of the talk was Wisdom and Sustainable Development, even though we didn't mention those words, wisdom, yes, but not sustainable development, um, I just wonder if you could comment a little bit on some of the things you talked about, specifically inequity. Um, and, and, you know, it's widely known that, you know, this climate crisis, you know, has created this inequity, and I'm just wondering if the wisdom that you're talking about, given that this is, you know, a, a crisis that requires quick action, um, if there's wisdom, how you, each of you, believe that we can move more quickly and apply these. Maybe I'll say uh, just a couple of uh, words about that. Sustainable development means that we uh, reorient our societies and our economies so that the prosperity that we have is uh, inclusive, justly, fairly shared, and environmentally sustainable, which is certainly not the situation in the world today. We're very rich, but uh, with huge inequalities 2,208 billionaires with $10 trillion of net worth, and then uh, millions of people dying of extreme poverty every year. It's weird, but that's the world, actually. Uh, and environmentally, we're at the end of a long period of neglect. Uh, that has brought us to imminent uh, global climate and biodiversity peril. So we have failed to act on the environmental crises for more than 30 years now. In 1992, 26 years ago, we signed several critical treaties and have not implemented them. And so the situation today is as dire as you saw uh, with the fires in California or the 
hurricane that claimed more than 3,000 lives in Puerto Rico, or droughts and floods and sea level rise all over the world. It's quite bad. I can tell you the most basic point you should understand is that these are solvable problems and they would not cost that much to solve. Perhaps three or four percent of our annual production worldwide redirected towards these purposes with a conscious effort. So we're not bereft of solutions. We're not bereft of technology. We're not bereft of uh, strategies. We are completely bereft of implementation. And you may or may not have noticed, because it's a non-event in a lot of ways, that there was a G20 meeting a few days ago in Buenos Aires. It accomplished precisely zero. So there was a tremendous amount of time, effort, money that went into it. And it means nothing. And part of the reason is, uh, probably the main reason, uh, is that the United States is completely adrift uh, without uh, any uh, normal, a scintilla of normalcy, and a president who is unfortunately a very sick man psychologically. And this is really a terrible problem for the world and a big danger. And the arrest yesterday of an executive of a Chinese company in Vancouver Airport is part of a world getting out of control. Uh, I'm in the middle of a little op-ed on the U.S.'s rogue nation. It's very dangerous what's happening. So we're not failing because of uh, the lack of things to do. We are failing because we're not doing the things that we should be doing. And this concept of acrasia, I like a lot, it means no self-control, no prudence, no judgment. And that's our danger. And I won't go on to belabor the point, uh, but what we need to do is change course. And as a, an economist and as an academic, I'm trying in my part with my colleagues to point out, here are things we can do, very practical, very important, and so forth. Uh, but um, to paraphrase the Beatles song, and I don't have it exactly right, uh, when uh, you say you want a revolution, we should fix our minds instead. Is that the, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Uh, we need to get our heads on straight to understand what to do. Getting our heads on straight will not end climate change, but it will say, oh, come over here with that map again. Let's look at that. You mean if you bring that solar energy here and you bring that wind power here, then we could uh, close down the, the following coal mines? So getting our heads on straight doesn't end the crises, but it makes you look at the solutions. And that's what we're not doing right now. And you may have noticed in our country, we haven't solved one thing in 30 years that I can recall. We have crises like the opioid epidemic, like crumbling infrastructure, uh, like uh, widening income inequality, uh, jobs crisis, uh, student debt crisis, and so on. You could make a long list of things we talk about in every election cycle. Nothing is solved because we do not have our heads on straight, it's not a serious process in this country of actually directing our attention to reduce the suffering and solve the problems. It's all games. It's all who can win. <clears throat> who are the killers? Who are the losers? There's no study. There's no planning. There's no thinking. And so this is really why 
coming back to the psychological issues, the personal behavior issues, the self-control issues, the middle path issues, are not irrelevant or the micro part, and then there's the macro part. We will not do the macro part unless we are focused that that's what we should do. For instance, save ourselves. That we have enough calm resolve to say, in a crisis, let us save ourselves. And that's why the head, the heart, the different kinds of knowledge are all interconnected now. And we're trying to find our way out of a kind of addiction, I think, at the global societal level. An addiction to what next quarter's GDP growth is going to be, or what is going to happen on the stock market the next moment, or who can do the following. And I remember, by the way, I'll just close with this. I had a realization this morning that I didn't have in the 46 years that I've been studying and teaching economics. <laughs> the concept we learn in addition to maximize your utility function, which is pretty bizarre when you start thinking about it, the other concept we learn is perfect competition. And I thought for the first time today, what a weird concept. Perfect competition. Competition is such a strange idea as an organizing principle for society to begin with, as your base principle. But we have perfect competition. <laughs> Instead of perfect cooperation, perfect compassion, or something else. And I never realized how strange it was till I was taking a shower this morning. So this is back to the shower theory of well-being. <laughs> we, we do have to close, but Venerable, if you have a wor one word um, or two. Yeah, yeah, can I have a say about that things? Because um, shower work, right? <laughs> you know, it's simple, but I really encourage from each home up to government, you must have a quiet time to reveal what you are doing to, to see. It will make you feel nice on the last day when you say goodbye to the world. You know, we need that moment, really, every day on a daily basis. Life is shower the body, right? We have a meeting, we are so busy. We shower anyway. We need this shower of the mind thing to really slow down and see 